All right, everyone, uh, thanks again for coming to my talk. It's always intimidating when the room is empty. Uh, so I really enjoy teaching people how to program. I spent most of my career in industry as a software engineering director, and then about five years ago, I got the opportunity to come uh, become a teacher full time. So I get to teach a lot of different people to program. On one end of the business, I, I get to teach uh, professionals who have found themselves doing repetitive, uh, or, or just they have tasks they want to do cheaper, or faster, or more reliably. And uh, Python is a great language to teach someone the basics very quickly, and then they can start automating, like creating spreadsheets. It's amazing how many people in Singapore have to take 50 spreadsheets they get from other places and consolidate them into a, a single spreadsheet with certain graphs, and they do this again and again. So I teach a variety of classes, uh, where we're teaching the introduction to Python, some intermediate, intermediate Python, and then um, some more advanced Python where you're doing about anything in Python that you could do in spreadsheets, and then going on to doing things like cloud computing in Python. Uh, some people work in very restrictive environments where their IT group just doesn't want them running Python uh, inside the firewall, or they want to try some stuff out and they don't have proprietary data, so all they want to do is be able to launch servers in the cloud, go run their experiments, and then once they've proven something, then they can bring it to, to IT. On the other end of the spectrum, I get to uh, go do these uh, workshops with secondary schools. And, and these are interesting because a lot of times there'll be a school that has a lot of students who want to try out programming, but they don't have that teacher. They have a teacher who'd love to leave the group, they're very enthusiastic, but they might be in fear of the student raising their hand and asking them over to tell them what's wrong with their code, right? And I myself have trouble walking over and within five seconds reading through 16 lines of code and saying, you missed a colon or you missed something, right? So a lot of what I see the opportunity in Singapore, what helps me do more workshops and train more people to do workshops is teaching that sort of real-time debugging or more importantly, avoid the students raising their hands and asking the teacher questions. The less they ask the teacher's questions, um, the more workshops, I think, will, will tend to happen. Uh, so I, I do think that learning can be sort of this fun and um, efficient process. Uh, it's getting easier and easier. I started doing things seriously about five years ago, and the, just the tools and the resources available uh, just keep getting better and better. Uh, so mainly when I talk about fun, I talk about hard fun. It's not like sitting on, you know, sitting beside the pool and drinking a Mai Tai. It's, um, it's really about something that you're going to find engaging and challenging. And these are, you know, some of the things from the research that, that people have uh, figured out make the activity truly uh, fun over the long term. All right, I, I've built a lot of uh, gaming systems over the years. I've played around with badges, completion metrics. Uh, we heard a little bit about gamification uh, before. And um, you know, I think I learn something each time I, I, I do one of these things. Uh, this is actually my family. Uh, they joined me on a project a couple of years back uh, when we were doing something called a mastery-based teaching. And uh, this is my beautiful daughter, Shannon, and there's my son, Christian, over on the right. And we were just trying to encourage people in the way the student wanted to be encouraged. Uh, some people want to be, you know, they just want it to be fun, easygoing. They want to not be embarrassed around their friends when they're coding. Other people seem, seem to want the Marine Corps drill sergeant in me, uh, you know, pushing them harder, telling them they can uh, do better. So we let students select how they wanted to be coached or encouraged, and it was interesting. Not everybody uh, chooses the nice person, but, well, it's something I learned. Um, but fundamentally, all these online systems, it's all about making it like a game, adapting to you. The reason we like Tetris is if we're really good, it speeds up until we're not bored anymore and we're challenged. And if we start getting overwhelmed, it backs off a little bit, you know? And it tries to stay right in that sweet spot where it's not too um, frustrating and it's not too boring um, either. Okay, so um, a lot of these games uh, you find online, you put code in a box, hopefully there's some tests that run and then it tells you if you got it right or wrong. Um, so one of my latest games that I use in the classroom that I encourage for self-directed uh, learners is uh, Code Combat. Uh, I've watched a five-year-old start playing Code Combat and be four levels in, um, just didn't even know it was coding, writing Python code, and mom said, time to come eat now, we're having dinner with Professor Bosch, and he said, no, please, I want to keep playing uh, for a few more minutes. So that was one of the things that really caught my attention. That was about a year ago. When a five-year-old won't stop learning to program, I said, maybe there's something there. 
So this last year when we did um, the national competitions, uh, rather than telling people to go play my game or earn badges on codeschool.com or treehouse.com, in addition I said, you can just go play this game. And so we had a lot of students taught themselves how to program with no teachers at their school and then qualified uh, for some of the events. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but all of that is really sort of in the self-directed learning uh, sort of phase. Or what you would give students as homework so that they could practice on their own. But what I'm really interested in on my research side is this idea of blended learning, where I have all these great online tools and I'm going to have an opportunity to have the students in a classroom like this with me and more importantly, with each other. And so I want to leverage that resource in addition to leveraging uh, all the great tools and resources that are online. Um, so some different examples of blended learning might be this. Uh, I don't do a lot of station rotation or lab rotation. Other people might have more experience with that. I tend to do more of the flipped classroom model and do more of the uh, what, what, what's referred to as the flex model. Uh, the flipped classroom model is just anything that's one way, like what I'm doing to you guys now. That's the stuff I want to assign as homework. Right? Uh, you can watch the video of me. If we're not doing a question and answer, just watch the video. Come to class. In class, we're going to do the discussion. And I've also found that if I assign too much homework, although it'll challenge some students, other students, they get really frustrated when they can't get it to compile. And they end up not liking the subject, not liking the class, because they're just there by themselves at home going, I don't know what to do. So I try and bring more of the challenging problems into the classroom where I am and other uh, students are there to help. And then maybe the easier stuff, just the basic practice stuff, that's the stuff that um, I would leave for homework. Now, someone alluded to it earlier today that you often run into this problem in a class. A lot of these kids, they are teaching themselves to code. They do get interested and go off and learn things on their own. So they walk into the class and they're almost the expert or could know as much as, as their teacher. Uh, with me, the subjects I teach at university like cloud computing and big data analytics, sometimes I have students come in, they know more about the latest technology than I did because I was working on something else last month and they've read the latest articles from Google or Facebook and it can be intimidating. For me, so I'm sure there are other teachers out there who may run into that with their star students as well. So you tend to have my general uh, feel across both professional, secondary school, and, and university is you'll have this like top 20% that you've got to update the course every year just to keep up with them, and you've got to be ready for them um, for you know challenge exercises, more projects on. Otherwise, they'll get bored and they may complain on your feedback for your course or they may just tell everybody the teacher didn't teach you know, what should have been taught. And then on the other end, you have the people who came in and they truly were novices. They want you to teach them. They've never coded before. Maybe they didn't even want to be in the class, but it's a required class in their curriculum. So they both don't have the skill and they don't have the motivation. So this is sort of, I think, the continual challenge. The middle, eh, they seem to do just fine. You're always sort of uh, having to uh, adjust based on that top 20% and bottom 20%. All right, so something typical for my data, like running a lot of uh, competitions and just in-class labs, is you'll always have this one guy who gets done in about 10 minutes with like all 10 problems that you thought were gonna take an hour. And then there's some other people who are sort of like them. And then down here at the bottom, which I won't show, um, there's those four or five people who they're still on problem one. And if you gave them five hours, they might still never finish um, the 10 problems that weren't quite challenging enough for the, for the most technical student. All right, so, um, when I go to, when I do like research and publishing and things like that, I go crunch a lot of data from events. And you know, what you find out is a lot of times the, the slower students are the ones that hold back your class. Or your class ends up sitting idle if you don't give them uh, extra you know, credit or extra, you know, other activities to do. Those slowest students can really, really hold you back. All right, another thing that can hold you back is if you're in a classroom and you're challenging the kids, uh, I always have this second hand up problem. The first hand up, no problem, I get up, I go over and I say, you missed a semicolon, or well, let me explain to you how, how a loop works. But if there's two hands up, now someone's waiting on me and I'm the bottom. And even if I have an instructor helping me out, well, okay, now I can handle two hands up, but then the third hand up, we're back to the same issue again. I'm the, I'm the bottleneck. So I'm always looking for how do I get myself out of that bottleneck, and if I have an instructor helping me out, how do I get that teaching assistant instructor um, out of there as well? So, so from the research, uh, I really like a lot of the work by Bloom, and uh, he did a lot of work to show, you know, you're always trying to get to this performance of every student having that one-on-one -on -one tutor. 
you can get a student a one-on-one -on -one tutor, they're going to learn faster, retain more, probably enjoy it more. And like on the other end is lecture, just like what I'm doing now, just sharing information. And so he did a lot of this uh, work in the middle of where he talks about mastery learning. And mastery learning is really the student goes and learns it on their own, and then they go over to another teaching assistant, or sometimes just another student who already took the course, and they sort of prove that they know it, and then they're allowed to move on to the next step. And I was looking at this, I was saying, you know what, that's really sort of the key. How do I get my students teaching each other, helping each other? Because really what you want in a classroom that's working really well, or at least in the technical courses I teach, is um, everybody just helping each other. I don't know if you've ever, if you're a teacher, you've ever had this happen. It's almost like you can just sit back and watch. You have to teach one kid how to do something, and it just spreads through the class like wildfire, right? And, and that's a really fun, exciting thing to do. Um, and the only questions you get tend to be the very challenging ones that none of the students do the answer to. Now the problem is, that doesn't always happen. I've had classes that it just works, and I've had other classes where no matter what I seem to say, everybody just won't talk to each other, uh, they don't want to get up, they don't want to mingle, and you just some, some classes are more um, collaborative and maybe extroverted than others. So, <clears throat> Um, I've, I've done things like told students, hey, when you're finished, go find another student and help them. I've been more specific and said, you're, who, whoever finishes on your row, you have to get the rest of the row to finish before you're allowed to go look at your Facebook, your instant messaging, or your other classwork, whatever that, that, that stuff is. Uh, but still, when I, when I would do that, just sort of encouraging them, you know, you, it would be hard for some people. Right? You have to walk over and say, um, hi, I'm, I'm here to help you. Prof Bosch told me to help you. And that's, that's very awkward. Right? So one way that I, I went around this is I said, okay, I'll just assign you. And I went off and did some research where as soon as the first person in a tournament would get done, I would then say, all right, number one, you got done first. Go find number 13. Everybody's name's there. They get assigned the person's name, and they'd walk over. And this worked out really well, because now it allowed me to start personalizing my classrooms. Because now, the fastest person, not only do they get to do all the work on their own, now they get to practice speaking code. Scope, curly brace, semicolon, how do I say that, right? And they get a chance to mentor. Which, if they really have great technical skills, they're probably going to need to mentor their coworkers and their staff when they get out to the room. Um, the people in the middle, they sort of do their own work, just like they would normally. And now the people who are in maybe that bottom 20%, uh, now they each get a personal one-on-one -on -one mentor. The less prepared they are for class, the sooner someone's going to show up and say, hi, I'm John, I'm here to help. Right? And so I find that that just sort of naturally, um, no matter what the level of the class is, I get a better distribution of, like, of sharing, the knowledge flows a little quicker. And for me, as someone who's facilitating the class, it bounds the amount of time it's going to take me to get everybody to solve five problems, ten problems, whatever the lab work of the day might be. All right. Now, the hard part of this, sometimes now I'm asking other students to walk over and look at another student's code, which can be very hard for them. So I like tools that make it very easy, not only for students to figure out their own problems, I like tools that help their peers look at their code and quickly understand what's going on. So if you haven't seen Python Tutor, pythontutor.com is great, because I just put code in a box, and then you get to step through the code step by step, rather than just running it and you have to do it in your head. And the really advanced students, they can do that. But if you're new to coding or you're just, you just weren't born a, a super coder, it's great just to move at more human speed and clip through the code. Uh, you can make interactive programs where you're giving the computer strings and then printing them out. And what Python does, Tutor does that's very nice is you have your code up here, they'll show you the output down here, and then over here they'll show you what's in Python's memory. And that's very helpful, especially when you start working with lists and dictionaries and someone says, well, I added it to the list. And when I'm debugging, can look over and says, well, it's not in the list, so let's back up. You think it did something that it evidently um, did not. So it helps me to debug faster and helps other students to, uh, to be good debuggers as well. All right, the other really nice thing I like about things like Python Tutor is this idea that you can just share your code as a URL. Means I can take any assignment, just put comments. Please go make a program that does this make a URL, and then I can give that to the students. They click on the URL, it gives them starter code. Then when they're done, they can make a URL of their answer and give it back to me. 
right? So if you don't have any um, learning management systems that you're teaching today, you could just go out with a Google spreadsheet, which most MOE schools, if not all, I believe have. Just open up a Google spreadsheet, um, put your links at the top. There's a fancy way you can give them, make it a hyperlink with like the words. And then your students can just click on the assignments one at a time. And then when they solve the code, they can give you a link back. And in a classroom environment, because the main uh, focus of my talk today is how to sort of uh, make the most of the diversity in your class. Um, what I find is really helpful is if I put like this countdown timer up here, which is just a formula that says how many people have put something in the box by their name. If I have this countdown timer, now the whole class knows how long it's going to be until we get to work on the next problem. Or until, until you know, the professor instructor pastes the next problem into the next Excel spreadsheet uh, column. And so now, rather than going off and working on their Facebook or checking their messages or doing something else, students are more likely to get up and go help someone else because they're trying to get the whole class sort of through the material a little bit quicker. And I, I have a general rule of thumb that as soon as about 80% of the students are done, then I'll move on to the next task. Uh, because I figure 80% means not too many people are sitting around with nothing to do. And it also means that um, when I get to 80%, it seems like that last 20% always catch up and get done either at the break uh, or before the next class. If you want to get fancier, you can go build your own tools. I do write a lot of JavaScript and a lot of Django code, but it's usually for the more advanced stuff, like I don't want you to see everyone else's links, so I'm not going to put it in a spreadsheet. Or I want to track the timing. How long was it from the time I assigned the assignment to the time that 50% of the class finished the assignment correctly? Or I want to go off and do some auto-assessment. You gave me your code, I ran these tests, your code wasn't, wasn't quite right. Um, so I create tools like that, and I also like to integrate with third-party services, because a lot of people have already created a lot of free games and a lot of free content, like Code Academy, Code School, Treehouse, and of course, Code Combat. So I'll have students give me their, their usernames on those services, if they make their profiles public, then I can just assign games for homework. Go get to level five on Code Combat before you come to class in week two. Go earn the Code School badge on Node.js before you come to Cloud Computing next week because we're going to talk about non-blocking I.O. Very little effort on my part, and then the students also get access to what is really very well produced uh, world-class uh, material. All right, uh, so Code Combat, I mentioned that before. That's really good for sort of self-directed step-by-step -step from like the five-year-old up, but it's also real Python code. And uh, they've made one or two small things where they've added some extra keywords uh, to make it very easy for beginners. But once you get to like their second campaign, it's all Python. And you can solve hard Python problems. Uh, I was playing with uh, another teacher here in Singapore, and he got me hooked because he kept moving ahead of me in the ladder and taunting me via email. And then the next thing you know, I'm writing this incredibly complex multi-agent traveling salesman problem code to more efficiently gather gold than my competitor, and then trying to do resource allocation to figure out when should I build soldiers and when should I build archers, which could shoot at range. And when, it, when all of a sudden I realized I had lost five hours of my life on this game and had not planned to, I said, okay, there might, there might be something here. So we did this back in March. We invited all um, JC and Poly students to go teach themselves how to program if they didn't know already, and to qualify for a live event that we held at SMU and we gave away prizes. And so it was like Dota 2, I don't know if you've heard of Dota 2 or World of Warcraft, um, but the idea is you know, you have to go grab, gap, gather resources, gold, silver, and then you have to build uh, soldiers, archers, uh, other types of units. And the main idea is just kill your opponent before your opponent kills you, all right? Uh, but instead of using your mouse and keyboard, you have to write code. So this is a PyConish sort of talk, this is code in my slide. You always have to have code in the PyCon talks uh, when they come up. So this is an example of actual code that a student who had, I don't believe, had ever seen Code Combat arenas before that day, they put this code in their box, working with their partner, in order to not be at the bottom of the ranking. They weren't at the top of the ranking, but they weren't at the bottom of the ranking either. And this is pretty concise code, but this is what it took to beat a good number of the people in the room. So the Pythonistas in the room are nodding their heads like, I see that, if then. So just, you know, one quick example. 
If you have enough gold to build a soldier and the number of friends you have is less than three, build more soldiers. We just need to defend ourselves if, if someone um, rushes at us. If you've got more gold than it takes to build an archer, go build an archer. And then for each friend in your friends, if there's an enemy, go and attack that enemy. So this is very simple code, is just have everybody go attack the closest enemy um, to your leader. Okay, so um, that was so much fun. I'll show a video here at the end of what that was like. But it was so much fun, we're gonna do it again. Uh, we did it with JCs and Polys this September, as, um, as Joseph from IDA mentioned earlier, we're gonna open it up for secondary school students. And um, that is, it's all secondary school students. So if it's a secondary school you know of, and they don't have any computer electives at all, or don't even have a club, they can still come online, register, play. And if they're, you know, if they have the top two, if two of the people from their school play, um, they can get invited for the live event. And I can't tell you any more about the live event because they haven't formally announced it. But the prizes are going to be cool. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a bigger venue that, than we did the last event at. All right. So with that, I'll show you a quick video of what it's going to look like at the live event. And then that will be the, uh, the end of my talk. Let's see if I can get this working up here. see which one would win. And there's a Yeti in this game. If you see this big white thing up at the top, this Yeti, let's see if I can lower that down on the screen. This Yeti was meant to hurry along all games so that um, someone would be dead within like two minutes. And the Yeti is this undestructible, undestructible monster that would kill at least one of the heroes. And then the Yeti was not supposed to die, but the student's code was so good and they had so many units running, they killed the Yeti. And the CEO of Code Combat was on like the chat room and I was surprised when I saw him chat. He's like, oh my goodness, they killed the Yeti. So he was actually surprised at how good the Singaporean uh, students were. All right, so that's that. Okay, so with that, um, that is my talk. Yeah, that's my talk. If you have uh, any questions, I would be glad to take questions now. <laughs> Kids or to teach everyone. Yeah, yeah. in a non gamified uh, class, how okay. can you still engage uh, the guys you know who are, who are usually good or who you know that learn to, to go and help you to do the ones who are not? Okay, so, so I think there's two major problems, there's two major opportunities that I see. One is we want to get more, more kids like scattered throughout Singapore to have coding skills. We want to make sure there are more mentors. And this is one of the reasons I really like the competitions, because that does end up creating more mentors uh, throughout the various schools as these uh, self-directed kids go off and learn how to code in order to do well in these competitions and maybe walk away with the MacBook or something like that. And then on the other side, for teachers, we want to try and put the tools in their hands so that they can take advantage of those awesome students uh, in their class so that the teachers aren't the bottleneck. I actually think it's a lot easier to go train um, five to ten really good kids in each class who can help out than it is to necessarily graduate more computer science teachers and get them to select to go to schools, to each school, and to stay in those schools long term. 
So I think that's sort of the two ways I see the problem. Get a couple of great kids in each class and then try and figure out how to leverage those kids as much as possible. And not just to help you out and the weaker students, really to help them out as well so they can learn how to be better coaches and mentors uh, heading out into the workplace. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.